Hello and welcome to the Endless Possibilities podcast. My name is Garrett Dignam and I'm joined today by my good friend and co-host Eva. Hi, Hi Eva. This is episode 23 and today we have a special guest on the show, Partha Srinivasan. Hello Partha. Hi Partha. Hi Garrett. Hi Eva. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's it's so nice to have you on our podcast. I mean, I reached out like two months ago already because we really wanted to have you on. But for some reason, the emails got lost on the way. <laughs> the, the universe was looking for better timing. So it makes emails go away. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally yeah. see it the same way. Yeah. And now we're here and that's really great. Um, so first, we kind of want to talk a little bit how how we know Parta. Um, Garrett, do you want to start because you actually met in person? Yes. So yeah. I was on a retreat with an American teacher called Satri. I don't know, but maybe four years ago, four or five years ago in Ireland. And I met Parta and his wife there. Um, yeah, uh, in Ireland, in Knock, a place called Knock. Uh, and that was a very, very big part of my spiritual um, journey was 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 being introduced to those energies that were coming through that particular teacher. And then they led me on to Partha and then Partha led me on to Swami Sri Atmananda, um, who's who's the founder of the, the TT technique. Yeah, he Swami Sri Atmananda gave us this technique. Yeah. And he gave it to us in January 2021. Oh. So um, he has had this technique, if you will, in his proverbial back pocket for quite a long time. The genesis of this technique was came to him after his enlightenment. And uh, over time, he's been tweaking it and practicing it. And uh, finally, in 21, he felt it was ready mm. uh, to be given. And he taught it to three of us teachers, my wife, myself, and a gentleman called Devashish, David Mitchell, who is in Reno. And uh, the three of us have taught everyone since then. Mm -hmm. We're a few hundreds in, several hundreds in. Uh, but right now, I'm the only current active teacher. Devashish is a researcher in climate research, so he's a bit busy. And so I'm doing most of the current um, for the past couple of years. But let's go back to. Yeah. Yeah. We'll look um, back to this when I give you a little bit more background. Yeah. So yeah. can you give us a little bit of background about you, you, you Partha? Okay. So a little bit about me. I started this game 20 years ago, 2002. I started out in the world of Kriya. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the West, it's called the Cobra Breath. In the East, it would be called the Kriya Kundalini Pranayam. Uh, I whole thing got started out by reading a book called The Autobiography of a Yogi, Par Paramahamsa Yogananda. Mm -hmm. and, One of my favorite books. Yeah. So I wanted Kriya. I looked around, found someone in the US who was teaching. So I've been through that and a few other techniques. And then I kind of dropped out. I had a pretty big awakening in 2009, at which time I really didn't have a formal teacher. The technique was just taught to me by someone. I was practicing it for a while, a long time, actually. And then I kind of drifted. So when I had my awakening, I didn't really have a, a formal structure or something that could hold me through this awakening. So it lasted about six, nine months. And uh, after which I went back to my, what you call material world. Kids were young and in high school, so finished all that. And then it is the nature of the spiritual that people at certain paths of the path, you cannot deny it once it awakens in mm -hmm. this life. So it doesn't matter, I pushed it away, it comes back as interest. So a friend of mine, 
sent me this YouTube video about this American teacher called Sachri who was teaching from the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. So, so at that time, something in me wanted a bit more rigor. I wanted something that was being taught against scripture as opposed to just seat of the pants or free forming. So I went to a few retreats, followed him, and then came to India for a long retreat. Uh, Sachri has a six-week retreat once a year. This was after mm. the Ireland retreat where we met uh, Gareth. And so me and my wife and a few friends of ours from the U.S. had come here to Thiruvannamalai, which is where I am right now. And I'd spent six weeks in a long retreat here. So when we came here for that, my wife had come to the ashram, which is near the retreat place, and had met Swami Sri Atmananda. So that's where we first got linked up. And subsequently, in 2019, we met him in the U.S. when he had come there, and so forth. And he invited us to come back. And in 2020, during COVID, um, we were stuck at home with nothing but Zoom. Mm -hmm. So we developed a relationship with him and he taught us uh, a lot of knowledge that helped clarify uh, big chunks of the path and what it is and where we were and things like that. And so as part of that relationship in 2021, he gave us this technique because mm -hmm. he felt the time was right. And uh, as I go on to talk about the technique, the thing about this technique is, even though I, it's, we call it a meditation sometimes, it's actually a kriya, it's a technique. But it's a live technique, even though I teach it to people, it's actually transmitted to you. Your access is transmitted to you. That is why it works out the gate. Mm -hmm. And it carries the punch. If you keep it live, think of it like this. When it's first transmitted to you, you've prepared a lamp and somebody strikes a match and gives you a light. If you keep it alive, if you keep the lamp lit and protect it and grow it, that fire fueled by your aspiration is what burns all your samskaras. That's what powers the transformation. Mm. That's why we ask that you practice it every day. If you drop out, it's like the lamp goes out. You know, mm -hmm. what does it take to keep a lamp burning all the time? You have to constantly trim the wick, add oil, keep it protected. So yeah. that's the analogy. Most live techniques work like that. So he gave us this technique, and since then, this is what I do full time. We do some other things. We support people who go through the process of TT, have satsang on Saturday. Right now, we're doing the mother book by Sri Arbindo on yeah. weekends. So before that, we did the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. The idea is to provide some support to the mind and the intellect to resolve the questions that naturally arise when you go through this process. The new consciousness that's freed up has to be given a new framework to hang on to, failing which it'll go back to the old. And this is where you can see the cycling. People awaken, come to something, they're on the path for a while and then they disappear from your life. And then a year or two later, they reappear. So this cycling is part of the natural process. Mm -hmm. Not so short, but here we are in 2023. Yeah, yeah. Really, really great. Very interesting. Um, and how, how did it come about that you are teaching the technique? So Swamiji gave you that technique and then... You practice it yourself, I guess, for, for the whole so, time, yeah? So in the beginning, we practiced it with him. He monitored our systems. And then he asked us to teach the first batch of people. 
And so if you notice people who have gone through this process, you fill out this questionnaire. Yeah. So that questionnaire is used to tweak the system to your specific elemental structure, just to minimize the kickback. This is a technique. It's called the transcendence technique, but if you're open to it and your system is ready, it results in transformation. It triggers transformation of your lower nature. And in order to minimize that kickback, transformation, as both of you know, comes with its own set of challenges. To minimize that so that we maximize the retention, that people will stick with it. We have nothing to gain if they stick with it or not. As I said, you do the technique for the universe to empower the universal component. Pratik, can I just jump in really quick? When I was was told about the technique, I was informed that it was to help combat the dark forces at play in the world. Am I correct? Early on, was that how it was presented? That is one of the languaging you can use. Yeah. If you want to language in light and dark. Uh, it's a metaphor. Can... Yeah. Another yeah. way to language it is if you go even below that, all creation is composed of these five elemental forces. You would, in English, you would call it earth, water, fire, air, and ether. They're the elemental consciousness that span everything human, animate, inanimate, stellar, interstellar space, everything. It is the imbalance in this elemental consciousness on this planet that causes the resulting instability in consciousness that you're seeing. You can look at it from a human perspective and say, oh, this group of people, that group of people, light, dark. Yeah. All that has happened is the individual in one set of languaging has taken primacy over the universal. The mind has taken primacy over spirit. And some of the elements like earth, water, have taken primacy over fire, air, and ether. All the elements are necessary, but they have to be in harmony. When they are in harmony, the universal component is in harmony with the individual. Spirit and mind are in harmony. When they are in harmony, you will want to expand materially, but you will not jeopardize the spiritual aspect of you. It, you will put yourself in check. No one has to tell you. If you want to language it, you are a spark of the Supreme. You are God embodied. If you are God embodied, there is no power in creation that was meant to control you. So no social governmental system that relies on externally imposed control ever works from a spiritual perspective. That is why yoga was always supposed to be, it begins with self-imposed discipline. First statement of the Patanjali Yoga Sutra says it is a self-imposed discipline. So the solution in this technique was to harmonize the elemental stack within ourselves, thereby bringing harmony to our system and freeing up the universal component the spark, which is, if you will, caged by the lower nature of the human. Once we bring balance to one, the universal component is actually only one. So if we bring balance to this system, it automatically aids bringing balance to that system, that system, and everything around it. If you do this 
technique long enough, after a while, you really are not doing it because there is anything in it from you. You're doing it because you want to be full and then overflow. Then your presence field, because of the nature of this technique, starts harmonizing the elemental balance around you. Everybody you come into contact with and everything around you. So this is how the force of creation, if you will, God, built this as the only mechanism for him to intervene in his own creation, or if you prefer, for her to resolve the imbalance in her creation. Because each of us was imbued with free will. God never restricts your free will. So you are free to screw up her creation. There are no rules against it. Which means we are the only ones who can resolve it. And we can do it if we are conscious, willing collaborators to this force. The more imbalance there is, funnily, the lower the force descends, the more easily accessible it is. Now, remember, everything I'm telling you is being languaged in English mm. so that the mind can sort of, that. there is no concept of distance or height or any of these things, but it's, it just makes for good storying and can communicate something. Yeah. So the force is more easily accessible. The force that you access when you go transcendent is the force of Satchidananda. It's the force of creation itself. But when you open yourself up to it and become a willing channel to it, it comes in, harmonizes the elements, frees up the universal component, and if you are open and aspire, transforms the lower nature. Through the transformed system, you can retransmit. So that's the one thing that I invite people even when it becomes smooth sailing and you're filled with bliss, the natural tendency is, okay, I'm done with this. Move on. That's when you have nothing further to gain from it. And that's when you can contribute the most to existence by just becoming a retransmission channel for it. Mm. So, you can language it as light and dark, but there are multiple other ways to language it. The light and the dark follows, from my perspective, it's just samskaras. They're either tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic. They're all samskaras. So there is no dark versus light. It's a useful metaphor to use but all samskaras are samskaras, including the light ones. Yeah. And any samskara, the collection of whatever is left in you is what wails you and still has the power to limit that universal component from its full and free operation. Right? So now you do this you can call it your sacrifice as you go through stage two and you're suffering through your own samskaras. And when you liberate yourself from their predominant effect, then you are now free to some extent. Then you start contributing to freeing others. So I still practice it every single day, um, unless I catch a, a chest infection and I really can't hold my breath, mm -hmm. then I just sit silently or I just go back down to stage one, which has no breath requirement, and I kind of hang out in that space. So it's actually designed to be available to anyone who comes to it in stage one. And in stage one, all we are doing is hooking you up, if you will, to this channel of force, which is now well-established. Multiple people 
who have their own access, not just in the initial stages, think of it as Swamiji threw the light and protected it. And then the three of us grew it a little bit. Now we've grown it pretty big. Mm. So the more people who can add to it, the channel is more because the ones who are coming new to it draw from it the ability to support themselves. Uh, and Parta, how many people have we got doing the technique at the moment around the um, world? We've taught uh, upwards of 250 people. Okay. Um, there are people who have asked to be about 210 are on the mailing list today. How many are practicing at any given time? Uh, I don't bother asking for a survey, but about 30 to 40 people on a regular basis show up for the weekly. So once a week, we have a group sitting on Saturday night India time, Saturday morning US time. Uh, it's a little inconvenient for Europe being at four o'clock, but it's Saturday. And uh, the group sittings have a different energy. Um, it's a larger, more, um, it's as the group gets has gotten bigger, um, it gets uh, more powerful, if you can possibly use that word. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really, but we can use it. And, and the types of people who are drawn to this, Partha, is it people the, from all walks or is it serious spiritual seekers? Uh, so far, this is a hard sell for newbies. Yeah. This is a hard sell for people who are trying out their first technique. It seems to suit systems of those who are already committed. It really works well for people who have come to that stage where they say, okay, this is all I want in life. Now give me give me the tool that's going to cut hard and fast. Mm. This yeah. is the tool that cuts hard and fast. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so um, right now it's really for the, it seems to attract. I, I always believe in self-selection. So whoever shows up and stays with it was meant to show up and stay with it. Um, my job is to, like a coffee shop, my job is to hang the open sign. Mm -hmm. Except like in Europe, when you're off for a month, a year, uh, otherwise keep it open. Some days there's no one, some days there's a crowd and everything in between. And yeah. it's perfect who shows up. Yeah, I mean, exactly, because this is the aspiration part, right? So you need to feel drawn to it. You have to have this inner drive. Yes. Um, and then yes. and then you, you're you up for sticking to a technique, doing it every day for a certain amount of time. So, yeah. yeah. Can you can you describe just a little bit? I mean, we, we touched on it in the last podcast with Garrett, um, but like the, the stages and, and you can describe it a lot yes. better, of course, because this is what you do. So the, the technique is taught in three stages. The first stage is meant to be a gentle introduction to get you sort of settled into the technique and to the flow of grace. So if you do 54 sittings, the first nine sittings you have to do on your own. The first one is with me, where you actually learn and the technique is transmitted to you. You do eight more on your own. After that, you can join group sittings. And after that, you can do twice a day if you want. So if you're a Gareth or an Ava, you can blow through this in 30 plus days, the first mm -hmm. stage, and then you're ready for the next stage to learn the pranayam, which mm -hmm. is where things get a little bit more serious. The first stage is best effort. The second stage involves a very formal pranayam with a very specific count ratio for those who have done breathing techniques. And it is meant to activate your latent samskaras. These patterns, these ingrained patterns that you've accumulated in this lifetime and in prior lifetimes. It's not just restricted to this one. And 
begin the process of burning through them. Burning through them is a nice way of saying it, but the only way through a samskara is to activate it, experience it, mm. and then retain your awareness through the experience so the experience completes and then it's gone. So the key thing is all those things that Eva, you described, the lethargy, the dullness, the mood swings, the physical pain, these are all the experience, energetic experience of these samskaras. Now the key thing in this to note is there is no story. Mm -hmm. There is nothing for you to learn from this. They are experiences you could not complete. You just have to complete them. Any information that is contained that you need to know in terms of wisdom will get refined and delivered to you. You will get your aha afterwards. But when you are going through samskaras, you just go through them. And mm. the most efficient way through is to experience them as sensations in your body, experience them as energy in your body. Without a story, yeah. right? Yeah. Without just sit a with story, it. Yeah. without analyzing it, without mm. getting your intellect, your mind, your vital, nothing involved in it. Try to leave it at the physical, energetic level and go through it. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember you mentioning that and that was just really helpful because you, you just feel it. You Okay, you experience it coming up, then it's there, like your whole beingness is covered with that. Yep. And then... It's there for one, two, three days, whatever, and then it passes through. And then right away, you kind of get a little reward because you feel already a bit better and lighter. So you know what, why you're doing this for. So it's, yeah. Yes. Get a good feedback right away. So if you successfully stay through it, that hit of bliss is the indication of completion of that samskara. And then you get more space and you get a little bit more ease, if you will, in your body. That tells you that this was not a psychological exercise. It's your yeah. body that tells you the truth. The mind, it just makes up stories or yeah. it's whining all the time. The body will tell you. But right after you get over that little hit of bliss and you have more space, the next guy shows up because this expanded awareness, the space, which is a reflection of your expanding awareness, then draws the next one to be experienced and released and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, every time you do one, your awareness increases the amount of life energy that was trapped in the samskara is now free and available to power your consciousness. You have greater perception, greater awareness, if you will, and therefore can see the next samskara more clearly, deeper, subtler, so it forms this virtuous cycle. Karthik, can, can we explain samskaras to people? Because a, a, a lot of our audience, they don't understand samskaras. Okay, for, so for the okay. Western mind, what is a samskara? So you take a human being. You've taken five billion years to become this as a biological form. And then a few dozen, hundred or thousand lifetimes as a human being. As a human being, for the first time, nature evolved a vehicle sophisticated enough for consciousness to wake up to know itself as consciousness. Mm -hmm. No other vessel can do that. Which means...
Arta is gone at the moment. Okay. Okay. All right. So samskaras, the definition is this vessel has evolved that holds this consciousness. So there are errors in the biology itself, left over from our bacterial, reptilian, animal nature. A samskara is a basic pattern in consciousness. An eddy, if you will, or a ripple that seems to perpetuate itself and consciousness flows through that. If you look at a human being, it's what makes your personality go. It's the mental habits, it's the physical habit, it's the emotional habits. These ingrained latent patterns that are mental, emotional, physical are samskaras. But there is a whole bunch of samskaras that are predate your human. They are biologically built in. You can think of them as at that level as memory. Your biology has memory. Your cellular consciousness has memory. It gives a stable platform. So the reason why samskaras are there is it gives a stable platform for consciousness to then ascend from. So they're not bad, but when the consciousness, this piece of consciousness comes to that point in its evolution where it starts to awaken, to know itself as consciousness, then the stability of the platform that the samskaras provided no longer serve. Mm -hmm. Now you want to liberate yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to liberate yourself from the cage, from this set of veils that veil the essential divine nature of what you are. So you can think of samskaras as the collection of all those veils, all these patterns. But guess what? If I removed absolutely all the patterns, there's no difference between the three of us. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, why do we exist individually? But think about it. Think about a universe where there were 7 billion identical copies. Now, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, the creator also third so because he couldn't learn anything about herself. Right? And so, fragmented. So, now when we awaken to know ourselves, we will know ourselves as one. And if we transform our lower nature, not just burn some of these samskaras and leave the rest behind, but fully transform ourselves so that what is left can truly shine the divine light. Then you are manifesting divine through a unique lens. So even after the samskara is burnt, what it leaves is an imprint which is unique to you. And that collection of those memories or imprints is like a unique fingerprint. That's what even when three people become enlightened, they are three manifestations of divine. They are divine now. They are no longer human. They are no longer ignorant. They are no longer deluded. But they are three unique manifestations of divine, which is what divine is looking to wake up and know itself in an infinite number of ways. So that is what a samskara is from that level. From the working in the sewage garbage level, it's what makes you drink when you know it's bad for you. It's what makes you eat sweet when you know it's bad for you. It's what makes you get angry when somebody cuts you off at the red light, even though yeah. it's yeah. the fundamental aspects of your mental, vital, and physical mm -hmm. makeup. Okay, and I have a question. So um, people who feel drawn to the, these techniques, do they have a, a, um, a certain amount of some scars, like a similar amount of some scars is the system or does this varies completely? No, 
this varies completely. Mm -hmm. Some people only have one, but it's a big one and moving them, moving that one could take them 10 years, right? Wow. Some could go through a whole bunch of stuff. I, if I could see one thing, there's all levels of aspiration. There's all levels of samskaras that have come through here. Um, there are some that go through stage through, believe it or not, guys, they don't even register it. It was no different to them than stage one. Doesn't mean that they don't have samskaras. They could have all sattvic samskaras of the nice, pleasant kind. So mm -hmm. they didn't observe it. But in order to complete the spiritual journey, eventually you're going to have to give those up. So yeah. Partha, I I breezed through the, the the TT. I didn't have any of that stuff come up for me until the very end where I felt that my system got churned for about two weeks. But compared to like when I speak to other people who I who I've sent to you, a lot of them just they give up. It's like, oh, it's too much. It's too hard. I, I, I just, you know, I nobody wants to feel bad when they're doing a practice. Uh, and I find Westerners in particular, they go, you know what, I, I, I'll come back to it at another stage. But I didn't I didn't experience this. I, I know Eva did. So. The thing to remember, and you guys are teaching people and we all have this thing. Everyone who shows up in front of us shows up at a different point in evolution. Where they resume the journey in this life makes a big difference. And in what order they come to you, if they just resume their journey in this life and they meet this technique two years in, it's a completely different experience than if they awoke 10 years ago and they've put in 10 years of work and then they see this technique. So how much of the lift? And really, this is what the aspiration is. What are you doing this for? Now, the funny thing is the way I just languaged it even now, I realize as I'm languaging it, I'm not doing a great job selling this. Right? But, literally you're doing this for the universal, the human in you. And this is true, by the way, I have discovered after all this time of every single spiritual path, which is real. If any teacher told you what you had to endure to really get to the end of this path, there would be zero people left on the path. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so I agree. Having said that, this particular one, works, works really hard and fast. And you just have to find that time in your life when the aspiration lines up with your external life. And actually listen to the instructions so that you can be gentle on yourself, back it off. There are people who have playing with this knob and who have stayed with it for years. There are people who will go through three TT sittings a day because they cannot get through their human life without its support. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, there is no one rule because there is no one system. That is why we try to classify the system and support individually. Uh, traditionally, something like this would have been taught to you one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Uh, you know, Swamiji would have looked at your chart, your astrology, mapped out where you are resu resuming your spiritual life, what you have finished, what is left, what's the big boulder that's standing in your way and customize the sadhana. This is how it was done traditionally. So that you got through that first boulder, right? So... So can can I just just briefly because I remember in the beginning sitting in a in a group and Swami Atmananda came and I don't know if you remember this part that he he went through everybody who was on the screen and I remember sitting there meditating and I could sense when he got to me and I could sense that he was in my system 
and he was he was look I could I could sense it and I I went oh he sees that and I was like okay and I knew that he was aware of something in my system now I don't know how true that is but that's that's what I felt um that he 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 was able to cuz he went from each person to each person and I just knew I knew when he when he got to me I knew what he could see uh and it's funny that 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 shifted for me it did shift um is there any any truth in that that he can see them or even can you see what's happening in the in the participants i don't have the ability he has he can see yeah um my system knows it yeah. doesn't see and for best reasons i know what i need to know when i need to know not before not after not any other time so when people come to satsang when they're struggling what i need to know comes to me if you will mm. um see the thing about samskaras that people don't understand is you were never meant to go through this alone you were not both of you did the one thing at the one time when you couldn't take it any more you were supposed to reach out that is the point of surrender guys when you reach out it's not the weakness when you reach out is when you say i can't do this on my own that's what surrender feels like that's what surrender is i can't do this any more on my own so help me god mm. but i felt and, very supported very supported by you know these these regular meetings we had and i you we were able to write your emails um so i felt very supported through the whole process really have to that say that is yeah. what it is meant for because you can't do this alone so the way it actually works actual physicality is your samskara comes up to match your awareness the biggest one that you can hold comes up but it's not an exact process there are times when the human just can't hold it and can't take it energetically your awareness can hold it but the human's just not there's too much stuff happening in life when you reach out and you've experienced this you support people when someone reaches out in a satsang or an email or i have a zoom session with them the awareness of the person holding the space is added to your awareness it expands your awareness temporarily right you're borrowing somebody else's light coupled with your light now you deal with that whatever it is that you are experiencing experience it it's gone mm. this light can withdraw but you are now left with greater light it was always meant to be a collective effort satsang the sangha it was always meant to be like this but see we have become so individual you see when i said it was the individual over the universal we really didn't understand that statement right even in sadhana we want to do it individually there is no way to do sadhana individually guys creation allowed for an easy mechanism you just need the conscious attention of anybody else it doesn't have to be a teacher master just someone holding space for you with their awareness intact will help you move through an experience yeah i i totally agree um i had a friend and he he was so nice i was uh, able to send him voice messages so when i was going through the samskaras i just sent him like 10 15 minute voice messages and then he listened to it and then he came back to me and sharing uh, and and his understanding of it and stuff like that i was so helpful just having somebody who's listening and who's there and available so i totally agree yes that's mm. it the consciousness spans space and time if you just put an email in the mail what i've learned is if people put an email in the mail they surrendered mm. it's like okay it's off my plate somebody else is thinking about this problem and what i've learned is 
if I just see the email, some portion of me responds. See, the universal within me, my human can be drinking tea and watching email, reading email. The universal in me will reach out. Because the universal is one. Mm. And lift. We were always meant to go through this universally, collectively. Yeah. I, Pat, I remember when I was going through the awakening, um, I reached out to you and I, 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 I'd sent you an email about all the, 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 the kind of like the stops along the, the journey I was going through. And you came back and we, I think we spoke for about an hour. You were in India at the time. We spoke on WhatsApp and then you gave me, I seem to be lacking a framework for all the experiences I had got, been going through. And then you gave me, uh, you told me to go and get Swami Atmananda's advanced Gita studies. And I did. And I absolutely love them. I mean, I listened to them twice. I think it's like 50 hours or something. Uh, and it gave me so much. I got what I needed just from reaching out. I got that. I didn't know about the advanced Gita studies. Right. Yeah. And I got all so the support that, that I needed from them tapes. Yeah. That's the nature of the universe. You have to ask. Mm. See, the nature of grace, you have to aspire. Yeah. yeah. Grace will respond. Exactly. You have to aspire, you have to surrender grace response. The creator, she does not interfere in her creation. It is only in response to our invitation that she descends into our system. Mm -hmm. So that's, there are easy ways through it, but remember this, I'll offer this to everyone who finishes it and you realize it where you are. You had to go through absolutely everything you went to to get to where you are. Yeah. Because those were the personality constructs that ruled at that point in time and at every point of our journey the sum of our collective ignorance governs the choices we can make that's the best we do we can always look back and say i could have but that's not the point the i that could have did not exist at the point that the action was taken and the choice was made. The I that is now listening is not the I of yesterday, last month, last year. So yeah. it's, it's part of what I found to stick with any transformation technique. By the way, guys, this is not just TT. This process of transformation as opposed to just transcendence and liberation, which is what a lot of people are actually looking for, and <clears throat> requires that aspiration to stick with it. Most people are not looking for real spiritual growth. They're looking for a bit of peace, bit of bliss, something to calm the mind, something to settle the vital so that they can engage in life more fully. There are many techniques that do that. This one, when you are open to it and you aspire, results in transformation. But the result of going through it, you guys know, It is something yeah. that is transformative. Mm. And yeah, I mean, I you... feel, yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to say, I feel like it's, uh, it was a very big part of, of my journey. Like the TT was just a very big part and a very, helped me to move forward, you know, um, in a major way. So, yeah. And it, it has the power to take you all the way to unity consciousness. That's just it. When you transcend and you 
have settled all the lower nature in, more and more force can descend into your system, helping you ascend higher, if you will. Um, it's the nature of transformation that most people um, right now, partly through ignorance, because they don't even know the difference between just going for liberation and going for transformation so that you can become an instrument or a channel for this force. Oh, okay, so so I, I have uh, an observation, okay? So, so from what I gather, Swami Atmananda is closely linked to Sri Aurobindo and the mother, right? Some of his teachings. I also read the uh, the essays on the Gita and I could see I could see that he's also studied um, Sri Aurobindo's work. And Sri Aurobindo and the mother, they weren't interested in people becoming enlightened. They, they People would turn up at the ashram uh, and they would ask them what they wanted. And they'd say, oh, I want to become enlightened. enlightened. And they'd send them away. They'd say, go to, to Ramana Mah Maharishi, okay? Uh, so I kind of get that same vibe from the TT technique that it's not like, you know, it's not, you're not attracting people for, you know, to come and become enlightened it's more to enlighten the world as a as a as a whole right the messaging so far has been set like that yes, yes. you will get enlightened but to endure the pressure of transformation you really have to find a reason to do it that's greater than yourself mm. Right? You have to want to do it. Look at why you guys did it. If you well, did it for yourself, how far would you have gone? Right? So it is for the universal. There are benefits that accrue to the human. You will go through and get all the benefits that you would in a traditional path but you are aiming for much more than that. You're going much further than that. Yeah. And so the, the, the third part is to become a channel for so, these forces, right? right. So that's the so third the part. So the third yeah. part is when you have freed up your samskaras, the third stage is where you actually go transcendent. Now that doesn't mean these things happen linearly. I know people who have gone transcendent at the very first class while we were practicing, they just gone. Some of them came through you. So you probably know who they are and they might have shared with you. Yeah. But the third stage involves a pranayam, which if your system is clear enough, it crosses certain critical threshold conditions and sets up the condition for your Sahasrar to become activated, allowing it really to allow the force to descend. And then takes you up to experience the being or the awareness, takes you transcendent. The reason why we tell you in the third stage to do it and then stop it and come down is to bring a portion of that back down into the human and to allow that force to work on the human, not to use it under the direction of self-will. The self-will, no matter how smart you are or how knowledgeable you are, is still under the control of the ego. And if you read mother book, you will know you do not wish the mother to work under your direction. Mm -hmm. It is her force that is entering. You want to completely open and surrender to her and not use the Shakti in any way. That is why we tell you, don't heal, don't do any other Kriyas for two hours. Do everything before if you want. But when this force descend, let her have free reign in your system. And when you do stage three, we tell you not to go interact with people or do heavy mental work because it's a force that you want to work, not empower your mind. 
not fritter it away, if you will, through interaction or socializing, is to just keep it and hold it. Because the first thing that will want to happen is one of the components in your system will want to grab a hold of it and use it. Right? Either through this or through this, it will leak out. So for those six weeks, if you hold it, hold it, hold it, it will expand your system. So you can think of it as you're charging every day more and more, but you're preventing the discharge. Same thing why you have silence in a five-day retreat. Mm -hmm. You don't want the discharge. So these are some of the restrictions we put, and these are the reasons for the restrictions. Uh, there's no rocket science. Same thing why we say don't disclose it because it's not a rocket science technique, but you don't want to, out of sheer curiosity, try someone else's technique. It was designed for their elemental stack. It's yours. So, so that, that would be people teaching their technique. They learn it from you and then they go on and start telling other people. Uh, yeah. Yes, or, okay. or two people in the same house. Oh, that's not what Partha told me. He didn't tell me to do that. No, Partha told you something different than Partha told you. You practice yours. You practice yours. By the time you come to stage three, you're all doing the same technique. Okay. Mm. There's only one technique in that. And the technique sort of grows. As the channel has grown, as the number of people have grown, as you settle into the technique, it sort of starts teaching because as you go transcendent each time and return, then this force teaches. After that point, you're moving up because you surrender to the force and the force is what's doing the guidance, the teaching and doing what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I always love this understanding that the forces are teaching, you know, because then you, you get the information you need for your system and your highest truth. Yeah. So I, I totally always resonated with that. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. Yeah. it's the human that makes the journey. Mm. And each one of us was educated in a different culture, in a different country, in a different religion, we have so much samskaras that are still not gone. We still have stuff of such subtlety that make us our individual personality that is constantly filtering the information. So the only way you make progress is when this force customizes it if you will, in a way that your current mind and intellect can understand it. I always give this example that if you reach a certain state of consciousness and the three of us experience that same state of consciousness, one of us could see Jesus, one of us could see Buddha, and a third could just see light, right? Yeah. And then we're all arguing about ourselves as to who God, who's God, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's a state of consciousness. Each of us perceived it given our current ability to perceive and interpreted by the human mind, which had to resolve the unknowable into something it could know and then furthermore communicate, right? Yes. So this is like reading tea leaves or the raw shark test. We all saw yeah. something and then we reported. Yeah. And we all have a completely different uh, way of expressing that. Yeah. Yeah. And thank God for that. Because there are 7 billion people and they're all unique. There may be little clusters, little clumps. And everybody needs to find somebody, like I said, to take the next step in the journey. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. That somehow the mind and the ego collaborate and the intellect long enough to let 
that spark take one more step closer to source. That's it. Uh, Whatever uh, it takes to do that. Perth, can I ask a question uh, regarding the samskaras? Are we ever completely free of samskaras? Completely, like, or do we need a little bit keeping us here? You're, you're never going to be completely free of samskaras yet. You will know when the cycle changes during the year, if you are keeping track, you'll know how much you really still have. But typically, you deal with the tamasic and rajasic stuff and you're left with the sattvic stuff. And then you keep the sattvic stuff for a while and you get rid of some of the bigger ones and then they become subtler and subtler, finer and finer. Because to function in this world, you still need a personality. Guess, guess what is that personality? Yeah. That's the, the, that's the sum of your remaining samskaras. Yeah. Right? If you blow through everything, just completely blow through, you're not going to stay in that body for very long. The body's memory clock's going to run out. Right? A truly liberated while living in a body is, they say, traditionally three years. You're going to drop the body and go. Either that or you create samskara. Okay? They said, you know, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, one of the greatest greats, every day would go to his wife and ask, what's for lunch today? And would really look forward to lunch. Mm -hmm. So one day his wife, this is legend, I am telling it, I'm not great at these stories. His wife came and said, you know, you are a great soul. I mean, you are enlightened beyond measure and you're coming every day asking me what's for lunch. And he told her, the day I don't come in and ask you this question, know that you have three days. Hey. Right? So, no, we're never free of it. I, I don't worry about it actually being free of samskaras. The key is, if you're looking for transformation, you just want to get them transformed so that they can be useful. Your mind is not the enemy. Your mind's like an elephant. Untrained, it's a wild elephant. Trained, it's a well-trained elephant. What's the difference between the two in usefulness? Right? It's like that. Mm -hmm. So, samskaras become lighter and lighter and lighter. Even the samskara, of wanting to be a universal channel. That's a samskara. Mm. There is some degree of desire built into it. Mm. Right? So for a while you're swapping, swapping, swapping. One day maybe you just get completely tired of it and then merge into the Godhead and then you have none. And then did we have three years? Three days. Person has three, has three. <laughs> so, so this is this is why Sri Aurobindo and the mother did not want the propagation of this traditional path, because you escaped, but the planet did not change. You did not change consciousness on the planet. You did not divinize it. Mm. So they wanted people to work, and. The story goes that the mother had them all veiled, that if not, they would all be liberated this, and gone. The kind this of is what force... I heard. She would veil the, the students. They would stop the, 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 the process for them. Yeah. No, it's not stopping the process. It's leaving that final sattvic veil in so that they just worked. That's all they had to do. So that everything that had to be experienced and transformed was done. And through them, consciousness was getting divinized. Mm. But they didn't just drop. So even now I have some other masters who say, no, I have my disciples pinned. Otherwise, they would be gone out of here, bat out of heads. But I have work for them to do. So when we talk about them, is it them wanting to leave? Is it, is it you know, because I, I hear a lot of people, they go, I just want, finished i want done with this i want to i want to be gone i don't i i i really enjoy life 
Uh, I see it very differently. But I, I meet a lot of people who just want to transcend this reality and go. And go. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that is part of it is what they know. Part of it is the path in this life that that soul has taken that makes them come to it. Greater and greater knowledge of the actual game that's being played and the actual rules of the game. Maybe some of them will change their mind. Maybe if someone showed them a different game to play or a different way to play the game, right? But you're right. So that is what has traditionally been the path of liberation, the traditional path. Mm -hmm. This one is just like Arbindo. We're trying to say, transform your system and participate in life. Participate in life. But if you do this perfectly, there is no other heaven. This is it. This is the most physical reality in all creation. It's on this planet, right here. You can call it a hellhole. You can call it a basket case. You can call it whatever the heck you want. But believe me, this is heaven or hell. It all depends on your perception. Right? With yeah. the right consciousness, with the right perception, you can be in bliss all the time. Or you can suffer all the time or alternate between the two. Yeah, I mean, when a lot of the samskaras are cleared out of the system, most of them, it's like life experience changes so much, right? So you life is so much easier. It's more experienced as a flow and it's more enjoyable, you know? So that's, um, yeah. And th then you're embodying, you're embodying this, the new information, the new, the, the, the forces, yes. the, the light, yeah. Yes. So what I find is still people have tasted some degree of freedom. They don't even know what potential a human form has on this planet. It's, it's, that's it. If you tasted a bit of it, and if it became reliable, it wasn't a hit or miss thing. I woke up on a Sunday morning, I had a great day and Monday was shit, right? Fine. Once it starts becoming reliable and you understand that the gunas cycle and that your lower nature is going to cycle with the gunas of the planet, with the gunas of the cosmos, there is going to be an ebb and a flow Hard in consciousness. Can we again briefly describe, just explain the gunas uh, for for those who don't understand what they are? Okay, so gunas, we have the time. This is turns out to be a long one, so I let you guys cut me off whenever you want. Okay, we'll finish so, the gunas and then and then we'll call it a day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can look at consciousness. If you look at the Gita, the five great elements, and then you have the mind, the intellect, and the ego. These are supposed to be the eight components of the lower nature. But if you look at it as the threefold division of consciousness, you have sattva, rajas, and tamas. Tamas is what most people refer to as darkness. It's not. It's just ignorance. Or it's inertia, mm -hmm. resistance to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rajas is the force that expands horizontally, if you can think of materially. Inertia or ra uh, tamas resis or flows consciousness towards matter. Rajas expands material consciousness or expands consciousness towards matter. Sattva is the only force which ascends. So what you want to do is to have the right proportion of this. It's not that you will be 100% sattva. If you're 100% sattva, you will have an unstable system. You need some degree of inertia. You need some degree of rajas. Have you guys anywhere on your journey come to the stage where there was not enough force to get you out of bed in the morning? Not that you were dull. You just couldn't yeah. function. Yeah, d during the awakening, yeah, yeah. I, I, I sat on the sofa for most of, for, for best part of a year, you know, I just yeah. didn't want to do anything. I just was enjoying that So the that rajas freedom. went away. Yeah. 
the rajas yeah. goes away it so you brave. need you need all three yeah because consciousness does a jerk go like this it cycles right or it it does this so you need all three in the right proportion what's happened to creation right now is the amount of sattva as a proportion has dropped below the critical minimum so that the upward expansion in consciousness has been threatened there's too much tamas and rajas tamas and rajas is why the individual over the universal and the mind over spirit mm. that's a function of tamas and so these three gunas are what in traditional indian pantheon describe the movement of consciousness and they cycle all creation has it they cycle through they know no boundaries so when a rajasic cycle hits the sun let's say a solar flare releases it alters the guna flow in this solar system which is going to alter the balance on this planet which is going to alter the balance in garath right so inexplicably garath wakes up one morning and he's just got this rajas waiting to go which did not exist yesterday so people forget that and they're even at play on a daily basis right like even in from day to day they're going up and down and we're having different day cycles. to day every yeah. 48 minutes okay your elemental stack rotates and so we could be we could be very peaceful and then after lunch the changes and we want right. to get work done and then we get we right. get a lull and we want to sit around yeah if you look at your system and you observe it correctly there are times in the day where you're better at mental work there are times in the day where you're better at meditation there are times in the day yeah. where you're good for brute force physical work it all depends on these three gunas or if you want to look at them as the five elements how they are playing out in your system learn to figure it out and you know when to initiate an action for it to be successful mm. and when you're just fighting your own system yeah very interesting yeah very helpful mm. so is there anything else part that you'd like to to cover no, I pretty much whatever you guys want to go over. I think I've Eva, talked enough. <laughs> you've done a great job, I have to say. Yeah. Eva, have you anything? Yeah, I mean, if people want to learn this technique, what do they have to do? I have a short eight minute video. Watch it. And then there is a form. Just email me. All of them know you. They contact you, give them my email, they email me, and I give them a short Google form to fill to get this process started. When enough people gather, two, three, fours, I teach a class. Mm -hmm. Sometimes during the year, like for the next five weeks, I'm off teaching classes. I bunched them all up till last week, and then I'm taking some time off. And then we'll gather up more people, and then we will teach them. So we teach them as they come. There's no, at this point, formal rigorous schedule. So, so we'll link, we'll put a link down to the website and the video if you can. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So yeah. it's yogictransformation.org, the website, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then Perfect. my email is available there and the yeah, video yeah. is linked to there. Brilliant. Okay. Perfect. And and Gareth and Eva, for people who want to know about the process, there is a series of YouTube videos called Beyond Yoga Siddhi. It's in Swamiji's voice, but we've put subtitles so that people can understand his accent a little bit better. <laughs> but there are portions in there that cover samskaras and explain in more classical language about samskaras and things like and, that. And did I come across, I, I'm sure I heard Gita uh doing some of them did she i yes gita is the voiceover at the front end of the yeah videos. i thought they were really really yeah she did great yeah yeah brilliant yeah, so, all right thank yeah. you for this opportunity Martha, it was a you. great discussion and glad to catch up with you guys
Yeah, thank you so much. It's always like I love listening to you. I used to love it when we had the, the TT group sessions and you explaining because you explain everything so well. So I, I really enjoyed it. And also today. So that was so great information. So thank you so much for yeah being here. And so many people can listen now to it and benefit from it. So that's really great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Parta. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>